Hello again, this is Cassidy Frazee, and I am bringing you another in my series of video recaps of the first half of episode 6 of The Walking Dead. And today, or I should say right now on this episode, this recap, we are going to go over the most polarizing episode that I believe has ever been aired on The Walking Dead, even more so than The Grove. You know, because, well, let's face it, everyone loves to look at the flowers, unless Carol's standing behind you. And then you just don't want to be in the area. But the Grove doesn't even come close to this episode. Here's not here. Episode 6.1.4. This is the famous episode where we learn why Morgan is the person he now is which is really one of the most necessary episodes that The Walking Dead ever had to film. Because the last time Morgan had been seen, other than in little outtakes here and there, the last time there had been a full episode with Morgan had been all the way back in season three, near the end, in the episode Clear. And when we saw Morgan then, Morgan was a little... A little discombobulated let's put it that way there was a line around that time at the end of season three where we were first getting to meet the character that Rachel and I love to talk about the most crazy Rick who's different than just regular Rick crazy Rick and there was a line that Glenn said where he goes Rick's off wandering crazy town because Rick was losing his mind at that point. Uh, everything was just coming down on him. He wasn't handling the pressure well, and he was seeing zombie Laurie and everything else. Well, Rick might have been wandering crazy town, but the episode cleared showed us that Morgan was the fucking mayor of crazy town. He, that dude, was gone. He had completely just lost his mind. He had lost his wife. He had lost his child. He had lost everyone and everything he ever knew. He was just in full-blown survivalist mode and he was not handling it well. So it starts out with Morgan starting to talk to somebody and at this point we don't know who he's talking to. This is in the aftermath of the wolves attack on Alexandria so you know we're wondering what the hell's going on and you get the flashback to Morgan completely losing his shit all the way back in the episode clear where he actually accidentally burned his house down while he was in the middle of a, a crazy ass rant and he just goes off and lives in the woods and he is in full what we would call clear mindset when he talks about I got a clear what he means is anything that comes close to where he's at he kills walkers dead humans dead <laughs> probably like the squirrels and groundhogs are living in fear of him for if he finds him he's killing him and really Morgan's at this point Morgan's kind of like, uh, you know, he's pretty much waiting for nature to kill him. Really, that's what's happening. Morgan is not in the best of shape. He's just waiting to die. But before he goes, he's going to take out everybody in the neighborhood. And, you know, at one point you see this because he kills a father and a son who are out hiking and... He just offs them, you know. He, he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care. He's just totally in crazy pants mode. But then he comes upon a cabin in the woods, not to be confused with a Joss Whedon, uh, Whedon uh, movie. And we finally get to meet the only woman <laughs> in this episode, the lovely Tabitha. And we all love Tabitha. We know who Tabitha is. Tabitha's a goat. And he heard, he hears Tabitha's bleeding, which is what attracts him to it. And then, of course, he's warned off and told to leave. And that is when he gets knocked out and we eventually meet Eastman, who in his former life uh, was actually a, 
He was a, a staff psychologist, and he worked at one of the local prisons, probably the prison where Rick and everybody was holding up. But anyhow, um, yeah, that could be possible. You never know. Morgan wakes up in a cage, and you got to ask yourself, why does a guy have a cage out here in the middle of nowhere uh, in a house? And well, of course, Morgan's not asking those questions. Morgan's basically telling this guy to kill him. And that goes on for a long time. This guy is just, you know, he's trying to converse with Morgan, and Morgan's like, kill me, kill me, you know. And it, after a while, even Eastman just says, you know, this shit's getting monotonous. He's trying to teach Morgan. He, what he's trying to do is something that Rick pointed out to the governor way back at the end of, you know, episode, uh, not episode, uh, season four, was that we can come back from this stuff. We can come back. Of course, the governor was just, he was, he was the governor of crazy town. Morgan was the mayor. Rick, he's just living there. Um, he's trying to bring Morgan back. He's trying to give him this talk about What's going on? You know, why am I living out here in the woods? Why do I have a cage in my cabin? Uh, he finally even admits to the fact that the cage isn't even locked. You know, Morgan could have walked out of it at any time if he had felt like it. You discover that Eastman has this coat. He's there not wanting to kill anyone. Everything about him is all nonviolent. And he's trying to teach this to Morgan slowly. He's trying to convince him that even though the world has gone to hell, everyone is still, you know, precious snowflakes. They are. Everybody's a simple precious snowflake. And we have to adjust to that. And that's probably one of the hardest codes to live by. Is that when everything has gone to hell and everybody is a scumbag, you're still going to retain your humanity by saying, I refuse to kill you. Which of course is going to set up, we know, some rather interesting tension and drama in later episodes because, you know, a lot of other people are like, let's just, let's just do the asshole, let's just get him out. So we go through this, this, this long montage of Eastman more or less feeding his philosophy to Morgan. And Morgan, for his part, starts listening to it. Now, he could be listening to it because he's actually interested. He could be listening to it because he's got Stockholm Syndrome and he doesn't know what else to do. But Morgan starts taking to it. But at the same time, you could tell Morgan's having some difficulty with it. Uh, it, it isn't something you're going to learn overnight. It isn't something that going to come to you and stick with you. It's a hard concept. Like I said, when you live in a world where the dead are trying to eat you and everybody else is a scumbag, uh, to say, all life is precious, I refuse to kill you, I and I'm going to walk that line forever, that's a tough one. That's really tough. In the end of the episode, of course, things don't go bad, um, don't go well. Uh, Eastman's bit. But before he's bit, we learn one of the reasons why he adopted this attitude. And you discover that as in his job as a prison psychologist, uh, he discovered what he called the one truly evil man. And of course, he blew this guy's chance of getting a parole. So what happens? Well, the, the truly evil man, of course, manages to get put on a chain gang Thank you, State of Georgia, for still having chain gangs. <laughs> and he, of course, escapes from the chain gang. He goes to Eastman's house, and he murders Eastman's wife and daughter, which, if this were a comic book, and it might just be, although this, this story is not in the comic at all, but if it were a comic book, we would say that Eastman's wife and daughter were fridged. And that is a well-known trope where uh, someone close to a protagonist, usually female, usually a wife or girlfriend, or in this case wife and daughter, uh, are killed simply to advance 
the character story uh, to advance the character's you know development, and that's what happened. Uh, they were fridged. Comes from the expression "women in refrigerators," which you go look it up. I'm not going to explain it to you. Maybe I'll do another video recap about fridging one day. But anyway, uh, so. Right when everything's going to hell, Eastman kidnaps this dude, <laughs> brings him to the cabin, and locks him in the cell and starves him to death. And he ta he says, you know, it takes like two months to starve this guy to death, but finally he died. You know, just he couldn't take it anymore, and he starved to death and died, and then probably turned and Eastman, you know, dispatched him. So Eastman, in the end, blows himself away. He has to. Morgan decides that at that point he's going to strike out on his own because that was their plan. They were actually going to team up and this was going to be sort of like a, a keto uh, buddy movie because that's what, that's what Eastman was teaching Morgan is a keto. He was teaching him how to use the staff. He was teaching him how to use uh, this form of martial arts to defend himself and to subdue others without killing them. So they were going to strike out on this buddy movie. Uh, well, it didn't happen, so Morgan takes off. And at the end of the episode, you see Morgan, of course, in full hiking gear that we've already seen him in, finding the first sign leading him toward Terminus. And of course, that then leads him onwards to a couple of the uh, quick inserts at the end of episodes where we saw Morgan finding his way to Alexandria. In actuality, it's a very simple episode. It's, it's a character building episode. And before I want to get into anything personal, uh, my personal feelings on this, let me expound, expound on this just a little bit. Uh, back when, in the 70s when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of Harlan Ellison. If you don't know who Harlan Ellison is, look him up. He's probably like one of the greatest fantasy writers that's ever lived. Um, and his fantasy is not like elves and dwarfs and shit like that. Uh, it's usually pretty hard-boiled, uh, hardcore. Uh, at one point, he was the um, author with the most Hugo Awards. He has since been bested in that category, but still, he's left. He has an amazing body of uh, work behind him. And one of the things that he also used to do was a lot of non-fictional work. And back in the seventies. One of the two of the books of his that I had were The Glass Teat and The Other Glass Teat. And these were collections of television reviews that he did for the LA Free Press uh, back in like 1970, 71, in that area there. Harlan also has written scripts. In fact, he's won four uh, Screenwriter of America awards for scripts. Uh, writers, you know, he's done some amazing things with television. So he knows the business real well. And one of the things that he would always relate about television, and this is probably true about movies as well too because we've seen it happen, is that whenever something starts to run long, and they can tell that by either how many pages there are in the script or after they film it and they say, we gotta squeeze this down, we gotta lose two or three minutes here or there. He says that he would say that whenever something starts running long, the first thing to go are all the moments that are character building. You know, if we're going to have something that is going to improve the character, make the character grow, you know, push him or her to the edge, and then a little beyond to see what's going to happen with them. Movie time, that that goes. Television time, it goes. Why? Be because executives see that as being boring stuff. And generally speaking, a lot of audiences also see it as boring stuff because you're seeing internal growth within a fictional character. It's tough to write character building stuff. Uh, I am a writer, Rachel is a writer, we're both published, she has a little bit more success than me, but I'm working on it. But I can, we can tell you, writing things about characters and showing them how to grow, showing them growing within a story, it's not a simple thing to do. 
Here's Not Here is nothing more than 65 minutes of character building. That's it. It's a 65 minute episode. It ran for 90 minutes when it was on AMC. It's 65 minutes of character building. And that bored the shit out of most uh, viewers. You know, uh, when I say this is a polarizing episode that you either love it or you hate it. You either love it because you love the insights into Morgan's character. You love to see how he went from the mayor of Crazy Town to, you know, Master Splinter. And he's looking for his own little Ninja Turtles to, to train. Or you hate it because nothing's happening. <laughs> Nothing is going on. No zombies are dying. There's no there's no mass crazy shit going on. You know, it's just two guys learning staff forms and that's it. And they don't like it. It's a real tough thing. And it's also one of the things that if you really press people about it, it's really the the main reason why they'll say, I didn't like season two of The Walking Dead, because there's not a lot going on. Now we know today that season two happened because AMC cut the shit out of the budget, and they also imposed some ridiculous rule that they had to film so much of each episode indoors and stuff like that. But they didn't want to spend a lot of money on uh, zombie makeup and things like that, so they put everybody on the farm for the entire season. And then you have to write about that. And the entirety of season two pretty much became character building now. It may not have been good character building and it produced a shitload of jokes, particularly at Laurie's expense. But that's really what the whole second season was. And every time I watch season two, over and over and over again, I really pick up on a lot of the things that were happening in that season. And it's not completely the, the worst season that's ever been done. It's probably not, it's not the best either. But, you know, I can remember writing in my blog years ago that this was, it was like a gigantic idiot ball being tossed back and forth between the characters. There were a lot of stupid things going on, yes. But you were also seeing the aftermath, because really the incidents on the farm were only a few weeks after the start of the zombie apocalypse. Uh, when we see Rick come out of his coma in days gone by, you know, a few weeks later, we're really just seeing like a couple, three weeks down the road. So that's really what's happening. You're, you're actually seeing people trying to adjust. It is all character building, for good or bad. That's what here not, Here's Not Here is. It's all character building, and it, a lot of it drove people crazy. They didn't want to see Morgan. They wanted to know how Morgan got to be this person, but they didn't want to see it. And they wanted to think that, you know, maybe what happened was Morgan just turned, you know, full-on old hood crip, uh, slaughtered like you know a thousand dudes and then finally just said you know what I'm tired of the life it's time to just you know put the crime away and learn how to help people no that's not what happened unfortunately you got to see something that was a little different and a little unusual because most of what we've seen in The Walking Dead are people are just thrust into hell and they learn to either walk out or they learn to stay behind and suffer. And in The Walking Dead's case, they do a little of both. But um, that's why Here's Not Here is so polarizing. It is a hard episode to get through. And most people will tell you right off the bat they don't like it. Most fans will say stuff like, it sucks, there's nothing going on. But that's the thing about character building. You know, it takes time. It does. It's, you know, it's really cheap, lazy ass writing where you zip through like a, a two minute montage with some, you know, cool music in the background showing how they went from uh, I'm a complete loser who can't do anything to yes, I'm Mr. Super Cool. Watch me, watch me whack you out with my staff. You know, maybe in a Michael Bay movie that's acceptable. It doesn't work here. And I think if they had tried to do it in a cheap fashion, um, people would have still bitched. 
this is one of those episodes, again, you're either going to like or you're going to hate. Most people hate it. I personally, big surprise, I personally liked it. I think it was a good departure, especially from all the misery and shit that's happening in Season 6 and is going to continue to happen in Season 6 because if you know the comic, you know what's coming and it is not going to be pretty. So this was a nice little departure from all the misery porn that we hear about. There it is, episode 6.1.4, Here's Not Here. Which ends, by the way, I'm going to, we, we do find out that Tabitha dies. I was a little sad about that because I really didn't want to see the goat die. But the episode ends with Morgan t telling this story to the wolf he captured. He's got a wolf in his basement. Now this is going to lead to those unintended consequences you know, that we talked about before. Uh, coming back to bite you on the ass, yes, they will. Um, he's telling the story to the wolf, and then he goes outside and he hears someone yelling. Well, guess who that someone is? It's Rick. And why is Rick yelling? We're going to find out um, maybe now. No. Later. But that's what we're going to talk about now. Not now. Now. <laughs> We'll talk about it when I do that video recap. Uh, I'll see you later. This is Cassidy, and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye.